if you had to pick a tour pro out of a lineup and say, I think this is the one who's the best artist in the bunch. The waste management a few years back, and I painted the 16th hole uh, in five hours from start to finish. But we invited all the players after they peed off to come in and pick up a brush and, uh, and make a few marks on the picture. So that was pretty fun. But I, I can say that none of them really impressed me with their artistic abilities at that time. I'm Roberto, professional golfer and aspiring business guy. And I'm Dan, business guy and wannabe golfer. We met in college in a boring engineering class, made a connection through golf, and have been kicking around ideas on the business of golf ever since. On the Course Record Show, we talk to some of the smartest folks in the golf business and get the inside stories and strategies driving the business of golf forward. Welcome to the latest episode of the Course Record Show. Joining us today is famed golf artist Lee Wybranski. Lee, can't thank you enough for joining us. Look forward to this conversation. Thank you, Roberto. I'm really happy here with you guys. So Lee, I don't normally ask anyone over the age of seven this question, but I'm going to break my own rule. I saw somewhere that you don't paint with the color green, but you're a golf artist. What's the deal with that? <laughs> uh, I used uh, some green paint, as you might expect. It's just one of those things, uh, at least as, an, as a beginner uh, watercolorist at the time. I mean, I went to art school, but I really didn't get a lot of in-depth training to be a painter, so to speak. So when I started painting for golf, I kind of taught myself watercolor a bit. And I just found that if I use green paint, that the whole painting ended up looking like it came out of the same tube. Uh, so as a little workaround, basically to sort of force myself to be more varied in my hues and, and, and values, uh, I started mixing all of my greens. So I have like uh, two or three different blues that I always use and two or three different yellows. And of course, you can throw anything else in with that. Uh, but that way I was getting, uh, you know, less predictable colors, less, less, less predictable and less frequent uh, occurrences of the same uh, St. Patrick's Day green. <laughs> so is the goal in that case to really try to mimic what you're seeing with your eye as much as possible or create some kind of consistency with your aesthetic painting by painting? Probably more of the latter. Um, I'm probably more interested, even in live painting, I'm more interested in sort of capturing a mood or, or a spirit or a feel. Uh, so uh, it's more coming up with colors uh, that give a certain impression or maybe subtly impart a certain feel to the artwork, you know. A bright green versus a very muted olive green in a fairway, uh, one's going to give a feeling of timelessness and one's going to give a feeling maybe that it was just painted yesterday. Lee, I read an interview where you said, whenever I go and do these projects, I try to go and find the two or three main characters in the poster. What's going to be the star and what's going to be the two or three supporting actors? I think there's something there in that quote that goes beyond art. How do you see that star and supporting actor dynamic play out in your business, let's say, or your personal life? I don't know. That's a that's a very uh, tricky question, Roberto. <laughs> uh, I don't really think about too many things and with that same lens. I guess you might say um, that is sort of my problem solving hat. You know, we do so much design as well as all the art that we do here in our studio. They're very they're different, but there's a lot of overlap uh, to me. And uh, the designer in me uh, views uh, a lot of this as basically problem solving. You know, identifying what the challenge is for the project. And then right. seeking to come up with a strategy to accomplish those goals as 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 effectively as possible. What what made me that quote jump off the page to me is that there's a fashion designer in Atlanta, Sid Mashburn, and I know Sid a little bit. And he when he talks about like putting an outfit together, he said there can only be one lead singer, and he's a big rock and roll guy. So if you're wearing like the bright purple tie, you want to wear like uh, you know a muted jacket and not a a bright or patterned jacket and. I just got to thinking like, hey, you know, Dan has a team at, at work. Like when you're trying to put together pieces, uh, I thought that was an interesting lens to think about it. So mm -hmm. you mentioned art and design. I'm going to give away how left brained I am by even asking this question. But what's the difference between art and design? Art is uh, pictorial um, and it's expressive. Um, it creates a mood and a feeling, ideally. Design is more utilitarian. Uh, it any project that you are designing, there's goals that you're seeking to accomplish or problems that you're seeking to solve. 
messages that you are seeking to communicate. Speaking of goals, I mean, this year alone, you're doing projects for at least three major championships and the Ryder Cup. And I'm assuming a boatload of other projects too. I'm sure each of those different clients are very different, have different goals and have different needs for you. So talk about some of the biggest differences between some of those big projects and what those needs are that you're trying to meet. Maybe the first example that comes to mind is the U.S. Open and the Open Championship posters. Uh, so we do create the posters for all the major championships in golf, as well as the Ryder Cup. Uh, at the time that I began working uh, on the Open Championship poster, uh, 2012, I had already been creating the U.S. Open poster uh, for a few years, starting in 2008 at Torrey Pines. And I was very much uh, inclined uh, and motivated to make sure that the work that I did for the Open Championship had its own unique flavor uh, that was different uh, from the U.S. Open poster. You know, obviously being an American, that's our national championship. Uh, a lot of the work I do for the U.S. Open posters is based on American graphic traditions. I know, Roberto, you're into this stuff, but, uh, you know, uh, the, the WPA posters, the National Park posters, you know, a, a lot of that sort of you know, whether they were old stone lithos or screen prints or block prints, you know, typically the, the color, the colors were limited. There was limited palette and a lot of flat color. Uh, and composition was really what was used to sort of uh, create the impact. And when I started working for the Open at Lytham and uh, in St. Anne's in 12, uh, I jumped in with both feet to the great British railway posters and uh, really got into that uh, whole hog, you know. From a graphic standpoint, I feel like you can always tell uh, brands and, and identities that are European. They just have a distinctly different way about them than American brands, you know. And I, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to try and cross the ocean for that project. I wanted to create something that looked and felt uh, British. So it sounds like most of that comes from you and not necessarily the client asking to tweak something or make sure you think about X or Y and Z. That's your eye and your instinct telling you to go there. I certainly always solicit and welcome uh, and desire input from the client. I mean, I like to know, know everything up front. Uh, posters are very special to me because they are exactly that fulcrum between art and design. Um, you know, I'm not just paying for myself, I'm paying to really celebrate an event. So it's art, but it does have that ulterior motive of trying to really celebrate and showcase, you know, the client's uh, championships. There is messaging involved, like there is in good design, but there's also, you know, pure artistic vanity uh, in terms of creating something that looks the way I feel it should look, uh, being an artist uh, of some, you know, of some years. Uh, so. I, they usually want me to work my magic, but I always ask if there's anything spe specific from one year to the next or one project to the next. And if they want to add something or, or move a logo or something, we'll do that. But uh, by and large, I've been fortunate to sort of find, find the pocket, I think. Sounds like you have great clients and you do a great job for them. But one of the cool things hearing you explain the inspiration, the U.S. Open versus British Open, was I read about your your take on the 2009 Beth Page poster, which had a very National Parks inspired feel, and it was kind of the depths of the you know Great Recession, and it's an amazing golf course, but it doesn't have a railroad or it doesn't have a signature, and like that poster is amazing to me, and and, and hearing the story behind it, that is a really really cool story. We made hand pulled uh, silk screen, you know, hand printed serigraphs. Uh, uh, I think just a couple of hundred were sold on site as well. So uh, there was sort of a hand on quality that was neat to me because essentially they would have been made, those prints were made the, the same way the original, you know, parks posters would have been made in the 30s. Wow. Uh, literally the same technology. So there was a lot of uh, resonance with that project. The other interesting thing in reading you talk about some of your work is you do a poster and it's completed and then the event gets played. And Obviously, that event will be remembered by what happens during the tournament and who wins that tournament. And it kind of can lend a completely different color to the poster, which I had never thought of before. But you were like, Lucas Glover won in 2009 versus Tiger Woods in 2008. So just how you remember and how the kind of general golf population will see, you know, like 
Chambers Bay, like immediately you think Jordan Spieth, Dustin Johnson, right? And like, there's a story there that is now combined with your poster that you really had nothing. It kind of is out of your hands at that point. So um, how do you think about mm-hmm. how those, how those players tell the final part of, of your poster story? I mean, just selfishly, like uh, any other fan, probably uh, you want, you want your, your player to win or you want an exciting finish. Yeah, I mean, oh nine. I mean, that was the year the wrong guy won everything, as far as I can remember. I mean, <laughs> Glover won the U.S. Open, and Y. E. Yang won the PGA, and Stewart Sink. I mean, nothing against Stewart Sink. Obviously, he's an Open champion, but Tom Watson lost the uh, the Open Championship that year to to Sink. I mean, it was just yeah. Anyways, uh, uh, it's always just more fun. I mean, yeah. I think it it probably contributes, you know, to sales a little bit too, but I'm sure, you know, my, my first U S open tiger woods won uh, at Torrey Pines on a broken leg in a playoff next to the Pacific ocean. And, you know, I thought they were all going to be like that. A little bit. I know I was at the top of the mountain with that one, you know, I mean, there was, there's, there's rare, I can't imagine. I can't remember many more that had uh, that, that, that level of drama and excitement, but what about, in terms of business does the winner drive post your sales up or down i don't know i don't have hard data for that i know you're a data guy Dan. i don't really think that a that a big winner changes things too much unless of course it's tiger i mean if tiger's in something it changes things uh, considerably i mean we reprinted at least once maybe twice in 08 i've observed that uh, our strongest sales uh, at events have been due to pent up demand essentially uh, for example when the us open was a tory in uh, 08 you know, you had the Pacific Ocean and San Diego weather and Tiger in a playoff, but the U.S. Open hadn't been in Southern California in 50 years. And SoCal is golf crazy, you know. Uh, Chambers Bay, another big, big seller for us was um, U.S. Open had never been to the Pacific Northwest anywhere. And that's become a very affluent uh, corner of the country up there, you know. So uh, lots of times, Again, Marion, these are ones that come to mind. You know, no one ever thought the U.S. Open would go back to Marion. Man, in 13, it was insane. Yeah, I heard similar stories from Brookline. Dan, you were there that uh, some friends of mine in the merchandise business were like, people were trying to buy the fixtures because like it just hadn't, you know, the U.S. Open had not been in Brookline in 20 years, which is different right. than, you know, now Torrey and Pinehurst and Pebble and some of these kind of are every five years. So uh, you can see how how that would happen. So Transitioning a little bit towards your business, Lee, you've built a great business and you're really the preeminent name in the golf art. Did you see this as an end state? Like, did you see the potential of the market and thought you could build a business towards that? Or was it really more a case of taking that first step in that direction and you've just kept going and ended up where you are? Started out as the latter and kind of in the middle of the second quarter, it it morphed into the former. When I started doing the business that has become this business, um, I was a, you know, student or, you know, a recent graduate of art school, uh, and I was doing very fine pen and ink architectural renderings of private estates and institutions outside of Philadelphia, where I grew up. And then we showed that collection of work to golf and country clubs. Wingfoot hired me to do my first golf commission. And for the first couple of years I worked in golf, I was literally just drawing famous clubhouses. Um, So I didn't really have a very expansive idea of where I wanted to get to within this space. I mean, obviously, Wingfoot opened a lot of doors. I mean, after that first job, all of a sudden, a year later, I was a golf artist because I'd done all these projects for, for top 100 clubs around the Northeast. Basically, I got bit by the bug like a lot of people do. Uh, once I got into it and really learned about it and started to, to try to play it, um, I was I was all in. My only experience with golf as a kid was I tried caddying one summer, um, and this was like back in the 80s, and I was always skinny and nearsighted, so I was an awful caddy, and uh, and the members let me know it, and and the bags like were like lazy boy chairs back then, so. I went back to mowing lawns and, and, and I didn't visit golf course again for, for another 10 years, probably. Fast forward to today, you got your business, Levi Bransky Art and Design. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I sort of see some very distinct segments of your business, right? You've got your major championship posters right? and, and things like the Ryder Cup for events. You've got the work that you do for clubs, and I'm sure some of them you can sell, some of them you can't. 
and then use that your your logo business. Are those the three main segments you think about in your business? That's, so a, that's you, accurate. How do you balance between those? I'm sure you've got, I get the sense you've got more opportunities nowadays than you have time to pursue. So how do you go about picking the right projects? What 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 are some of the criteria you use to to make sure you're you're working on the stuff that really kind of gets you most excited? It's been a little bit of serendipity, I suppose, in that regard. I've always sought to associate myself with the best clubs the best organizations the best events you know i always had that attitude as an artist that it's a good thing to sort of hit your wagon to a star you know i mean to be you know to to be associated with that is there's just not a downside to it and uh you're going to do the work anyway so if you're going to do the work i'd rather the work get seen by 10,000 people than by 10 you know a thousand my time has become, you know, more, more valuable, more, more scarce. So the things that I'm going to put my, my eyes and hands on uh, need to be at a certain level um, uh, in terms of just the numbers, uh, the, 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 the business of the event or the, or the project. Um, and then for some of the smaller projects, I've been able to build a really amazing team uh, around me uh, for the last bunch of years. And they're able to execute my vision uh, on some of the uh, smaller uh, digital art projects. The projects that really, uh, you know, I touch are the are, you know, the more premier projects that we do, uh, and then we just try and uh, take the team approach to executing uh, some of the other projects and catching up with a few old friends that I've known from my early days in this business and trying to remember the last time I made a cold sales call. Uh, you know, because that's that's one of the the great stories of my professional career is at one point, you know, the business had become just me and I had to go out and sell my own work uh, way back, you know, 20 some years ago. And I had I would literally write out what I needed to say and, and then practice it because I was not someone who was comfortable to just make a make a cold sales call, you know. Anyways, uh, to my great satisfaction, it's been many years since I've made a a sales call, the phone just somehow keeps ringing. And obviously we're sort of a small boutique operation here and it's not too hard to keep us busy. How do you navigate that world of private clubs? So I noticed I went on your website and I can buy a print from Fisher's Island or Deepdale or Burning Tree. And those are some of the most private clubs in the United States. How do you, is it is it one off each case is individual or like, how do you navigate the world of private clubs without, you know, stepping over those trip wires that are seemingly around every yeah. corner? Uh, I just keep a sharp eye out for uh, trip wires and eggshells, you know, I mean, um, you don't want to step on anybody's toes in this business. And, um, you know, in short, uh, Roberto, I would just, I just simply, if the client doesn't want us to sell the work, yeah, uh, we won't, you know, I mean, it's uh, the client is the client and um, we make work for the client and, you know, most, almost every, any club commission project like that is being done for the club first and foremost. For the members um, and if that's really where they want to limit the life of the work to then I'm, I'm okay with that uh, fortunately my reputation how would you say this without sounding fat-headed but um, you know we've been fortunate to be able to build some collectability around my work so a lot of the clubs I think actually enjoy the association with me because Right. They're in good company on our website. Lee, in addition to the three buckets of your business that, that Dan described, you actually maybe branched out a little bit beyond that recently. Tell us about that. Is it a project around Philadelphia, Gil Hans? Sounds really interesting. I want to know more. Yeah, we've been, uh, you know, trying to trying to sort of explore other media uh, as well, uh, as a lot of other businesses are in the age we're living in. And, um, you know, one of the things that we've done is work with, Gil Hands and Tom Coyne on the documentary about golf in Philadelphia. Wow. Uh, so we self-produced this one hour documentary. Uh, Gil is, is, is a transplant in Philadelphia. Uh, he's been, uh, he's been a Philly guy since uh, he started building Stonewall back in, I think the late eighties. Uh, Tom Coyne, great golf writer and one of the oh, editors yeah. over at Golfers Journal. Also a good friend of mine. I met Tom uh, at his book signing for his first book, Gentleman's Game. Uh, and uh, he grew up in the in Delaware County where I was born. Uh, so he's a fellow Delco boy. And uh, we've known each other for the last 20 plus years. 
we thought it'd be neat to do something talking about how uh, we each viewed uh, our upbringing in Philadelphia around the golf of Philadelphia and then how Philadelphia golf has informed our work and also uh, how it stacks up or putting Philly golf in the context of, uh, you know, golf in America. Wow. Um, uh, so all being locals, you know, we had uh, easy banter and uh, a lot of uh, more agreements and disagreements over, uh, you know, uh, what we what we like to, to to talk about, which courses we like to play in Philly, um, but it was really really a super production. It was a really great project. It's on Amazon. It's beautifully shot. We visit uh, probably over ten of the the region's great golf courses and really talk a lot about what makes Philadelphia golf unique, special, and superior to any other type of American golf. Well, we'll definitely include a link to that in the show notes. That sounds like a really fun project and. Uh... Yeah, you got some some pretty good company there in terms of uh, who you're partnering with. That's great. I I recently met Tom Coyne for the first time at the PGA show, and uh, he's like every. I mean, it's just all jokes. He's just I couldn't tell if he was making fun of me half the time. It was a he's a fast, he's really funny dude. Incredibly funny, great writer, and uh, yeah. I mean, I almost feel like you know his his humor is almost more in person. I mean, I wouldn't most of his writing. I mean, there's dry wit in a lot of his writing, but yeah. I mean, he's bloody hysterical when you're chatting with him in person. So a trend that Dan and I have noticed and talked about is that in golf, you know, on the wave of people's passion and obsession for golf, that there are entire categories in the industry that probably were not existent 20, 25, 30 years ago, and now have are thriving, like your studio or like head covers, you know, our mutual friend at EP head covers, they have this fascinating art and incredible manufacturing and like when i was a kid you had a head cover for your putter and or maybe you didn't and now you know people have these <laughs> collections of dozens or hundreds of head covers so golf art golf photography uh head covers like have you seen that wave are we are we looking at it the right way and wh where does that go from here i'm a sort of i marvel at it like yourselves uh i i don't feel like i have any wisdom to share uh, but i can certainly share observations. I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, there was art in golf when I came along. I mean, Linda Hartall sort of uh, is this artist that almost invented the space of, uh, of ultra fine uh, oil painting golf landscapes. Uh, and she was selling her prints at the US Open, at the Open Championship. Very, very different kind of work, very traditional golf landscape painting, uh, but exceptional craft. And and really a formidable uh, business entity. I mean, her originals were significantly priced, uh, so she was very successful um, already in the space when I came around. Uh, there's an English artist, Kenneth Reed, whose work I'm, I'm a big admirer of, um, and he he was operating in, at the championship level as well as at the club level, although probably more overseas in the UK. Uh, anyway, I feel like in my particular business, so there's there was precedent is what I'm trying to say. I didn't feel like I kind of came out of nowhere. I mean, event posters, we just sort of brought a little bit to the golf poster, what already existed in the rock and roll uh, genre. You know, people like to go to collect concert posters and, you know, people collect Olympic posters and they were already making posters for most of these events. It's just that maybe uh, just because of the state of that poster design in the 80s, 90s was not superlative uh it was not like uh you know one of the high points so i feel like you know if anything maybe we just raised the bar in the areas that we focused our attentions on one of the things that i think made made my work stand out in the early days was that it was rooted and oriented towards that authentic and natural golf experience and ethos and i feel that well, <laughs> it's almost like the world's come around. I don't mean to say it like that. I'll like, like I knew what I was doing. I was just drawn to what I was drawn to. But social media has enabled this whole community to, that it's really shaped the whole trend of golf towards that, I feel like. I mean, I know you guys have heard of the whole revival. Of, I mean, we're in a second golden age of golf design right now. I mean, the people who are building golf courses and the types of courses being built right now are just, they're classic. They're timeless. They're, you know community right authenticity and community and and people in a more electronic world i think people are desperate for that community and it's easy to yeah it's easy to laugh at the at the logos and, and wearing a logo but how often do you sit in an airport and it's like oh marion 
been there i'm from philly yeah. where are you from oh your our cousins yeah. know each it's community right. right it's there's nothing wrong with that and i think uh it's it's great to hear your perspective on it it's fascinating it's really something it's impressive i'm i'm a big fan of all that i think that um the game needs it i mean it's it does it's, it's good it's like a revival almost it's uh the other sort of like a reincarnation almost i feel like the the golf zealots today are not are completely different than the golf zealots from 30 years ago it's something we talked about with joe ogilvy too there's a place for everybody now too there's mm. a, a place for the, you know, the Marion member or the National Golf Links type member. And there's a place for the Eric Anders. No matter how you engage with the game and what part of it appeals to you or what community you want to be a part of, there's one out there for you. And that's awesome. It's it's kind of like music, right? Like no matter yeah. if you want to, if you want to get in a mosh pit and listen to death metal, <laughs> great. If you want to go to classical, I don't, I'm not sure that was always the case in golf, that there was something for everybody. And and the, the more that, that I continues. think there were like just a few buckets for, for many, many decades. Yeah. You know, there was the top tier, there was the, the middle tier private, and then there was public golf. And That's right. You mentioned tapping into authenticity. I couldn't think of a better segue to our next segment, which happens to be called tap-ins. So these are very short, quick hit answers. You've been very thoughtful in your answers so far. We're going to put the premium on speed. Ready for my tap-ins? I'm ready. Favorite course to play for you? Right now, Los Angeles Country Club. Favorite course to paint? Any course by the sea. You said you drew a lot of clubhouse, painted a lot of clubhouses. Best clubhouse in golf, in your opinion? I'm going to have to stay wing foot. Back to the, back to the, back to the roots. Back to the roots, man. Started at the top with that, that one. The coolest logo you can think of that you've done. What's the first one that comes to mind? Waterville. Roberto, you got a favorite here. I think the Whistling Straits logo is fascinating. Like the fact that it's essentially Herb Kohler turned into God form. And it's just, I think it, it just like, it's a haunting logo. It's, it's incredible. I, I'm a big fan of that logo as well. Um, I always have been. It's a little complicated on a, on a shirt, but uh, it's a great concept. We didn't yeah. do that one, but uh, I'm a fan of it. Who's your favorite artist, Lee? Someone who uh, finds his way into a lot of my paintings is Edward Hopper, who did the famous Nighthawks at the Diner uh, uh, painting. His colors and his compositions inform a lot of uh, a lot of my work. Real quick on the Whistling Straits, Lee, you did do the poster for the PGA Championship at Whistling Straits. The clouds above the course are essentially the logo of, of Herb. Col it, it just it's it's so cool. I love it. I love it. So you, you were involved there in, uh, I mean, you know, in a big I way. appreciate you saying that. And that was done because I was such a fan of the logo. I thought it was, I mean, it's incredible uh, hubris, I feel like, to make that the logo, right? <laughs> but I mean, more power to him. I mean, when you got a town named after you, I guess, I guess go for it. I think and that's, but it is, it's so, it's like Odin or, or the wind god or, or yes. you know, you look at those old maps, like cartography from the Renaissance era, there's often some face like that in the corner that's blowing and, and letting like kind of saying where the prevailing winds are. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I think it's an awesome logo. And when we got the poster opportunity for the PGA in 15, I mean, it was a no brainer to me. It was the first thing I thought of and that thing sold out. Like that was gone by Saturday morning's last tea time. I mean, it was, that was a good one. Well, when Roberto and I throw our first course record show events, we'll commission you for some work. Put some wings on Roberto. Give me like a thunderbolt, and off we go. That's <laughs> we'll, we'll peak the hubris that Herb Kohler threw out there. Thor and Kohler, you got it. All right. If you had to pick a tour pro out of a lineup and say, "I think this is the one who's the best artist in the bunch," who do you think that'd be? Well, I happen to know that Luke Donald is a is a pretty accomplished uh, painter. Just based on some uh, inside baseball, I would pick him. All right. I no, did no. a painting on the uh, 16th tee at the Waste Management a few years back. We did this thing with scratch golf, which was a lot of fun. During, during the Wednesday Pro-Am, we set up an easel, and I painted the 16th hole uh, in five hours from start to finish. But we invited all the players, after they teed off, to come in and pick up a brush and, uh, and make a few marks on the picture. So uh, we had a brand new JT back then. Um, I don't know, a bunch of guys, Kucher, Kevin Na, Russell Knox, um, Horschel, I think. Um, anyways, that was pretty fun. But I, I can say that none of them really impressed me with their artistic abilities at that time. Well, they were looking for the green in their defense, right? They probably couldn't find it. So, yeah. Right. <laughs> I pre-mixed um, a big batch of hot pink for Bubba. <laughs> <laughs> a 
that it was. So Lee, you talk about conveying emotion in your paintings. I'm going to give you some golf courses and I want you to list like sort of a feeling or emotion that you think it evokes the one word answer. Pebble Beach. Championship. St. Andrews. Natural. Marion. Classic. Oakmont. Hard. I would have used an expletive myself, but I think hard. <laughs> Brookline. Hmm. I don't know. Pastoral or bucolic. Bucolic. Wow. I got to go deep in the source for that one. I got to figure out. <laughs> well, Lee, you survived all the tap-ins. So over to Roberto for his segment. All right, Lee, mine are a little bit more business focused. We keep it very simple. Buy or sell. So the first one is buy or <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's pretty simple. Buy or sell. Artificial intelligence designing major championship posters one day. Well, I'm going to say sell. <laughs> joggers as golf pants, buy or sell? Sell. Joggers are for the range, I feel like, you know? <laughs> buy or sell Tesla stock? Sell. I'm not very, uh, very wealthy, so my, my selling advice might not be uh, anything anyone would want to listen to, but sorry, go on. No, no. This... Your financial professional before investing in this advice. Yes, <laughs> right. yeah, there's a there's a long disclaimer to this section that we uh, leave Excellent. in the show in the show notes. Buy or sell on the ground golf photography or drone golf photography? I like on the ground. Buy or sell wearing multiple logos at the same time. What rules do you follow? Uh, I have a simple rule: if I'm wearing multiple logos, they all need to be clients. Okay, <laughs> that's a good one. Nobody else can say that. My goodness, that's a good flex. I like that a lot. That's good thank stuff. You. But Lee, we can't thank you enough. This has been uh, just absolutely, possibly the most interesting and, and wide-ranging conversation on the Course Record Show. Lee, where can people find out more about your work? LeeWybranski.com. Uh, everything's pretty much there. Thank you, fellas. It's been a blast to be with you. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Please subscribe if you have not. And uh, we'll see you next time on the Course Record Show.